My name is Jim Cleaves. Are we alone? You and I? No. <laughs> I would be very surprised if we are. Why do you say that? The vastness of the cosmos. How about the unlikeliness of the origin of life? Is that, that not a factor? That is a factor. I don't, and I don't think we know the answer to how likely or unlikely life is. So therefore, we don't know whether we're alone. That's correct. But you said you'd be surprised if we were. I'd be surprised. Because you, in your head, in the back of your head, you have said there is more vastness than there is un, uh, improbability to the origin of life. That, that That's is basically it. how I would weigh it. That's okay, right. so tell me about this improbability of life not being as improbable as as the vastness of space, the inverse. I think, um, you know, based on the models we have of life being a product of chemistry, chemistry seems to be really universal. The kind of primitive solar system chemistry that there is, that we can observe, seems to be unitary throughout the cosmos as much as we can measure it. Okay, so the ingredients are certainly there, but how about the recipe? Couldn't that be particular? Uh, I don't see why it would be. I guess there's a question of what the rarity of exactly the right kind of planetary conditions are, but given how many stars there are and how many stars with planets, it seems like there's got to be a good number of those as well. Right. And do you think they all have life on them or only, I mean, if, if we, you said we're prob you'd be surprised if we were alone, well, how, what's your favorite solution to the Fermi's paradox? If we're not alone, then where are they? My favorite? Yes. I just read this nice book. What was it like 73 solutions to the Fermi Stephen paradox? Stephen Webb's new book. Yeah, have you read it? With the intro by Reese, Martin Rees. That's right? right. So I read the first one that only had 50, and I think now he has 75. I yeah, have something like this, yeah. But I mean, there are, some are better than others. Um, what's your favorite? I think that... Probably the more the question is that the level of consciousness we're at is a pretty short-lived one, and things are likely to be either very far behind you or very far ahead of you. Okay. So they'll be very difficult to recognize. Well, if they're very far ahead of us, they will have already colonized the galaxy, and that's the par paradox. Where are they? Is that, well, I thought, is it necessarily that they've colonized it or that there ought to be signals everywhere? Or, I mean, the galaxy is 100,000 years across, 100,000 yeah. light years across. Yeah, and if you travel a tenth of the speed of light, you can colonize in about a million years. Right, right. So the, the idea is, well, any civilization worth its salt could travel at one tenth the speed of light. Yeah. Well, so but, where are they? Well, yeah, by the time they get here, maybe you don't recognize them. Ah, so you think they are here, but we don't recognize them. It could very well be. Okay, can't see the forest for the trees issue. Uh, I mean, I, I really couldn't say. What, what does technology look like in 10,000 years? I think that's difficult to... to or a million years. Yeah, or, or a million or a billion years. years a billion right? years, yeah, this is really <laughs> difficult. So, but I think the, the odds of two civilizations being at roughly our state at the same point in time and coming into contact are probably pretty low. Uh, but that wasn't the question, though. The question is, uh, you know, if they were really, really advanced, they will have colonized and we would know them for sure. But you're saying that maybe they're so advanced that you wouldn't recognize them? Is that or they, maybe they get so advanced there's no point to colonization anymore, right? They move no past that. No point to colonization. <laughs> Masturbation is... <laughs> Something. I don't know. They just... They don't... No point to colonization. Yeah. Wow. What an anti-biological thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, don't, don't look at our birth rates drop as we, you know, industrialize and so but on. But we're still moving to larger portions of the earth, though. The birth rate's going down, but uh, I guess the population keeps on going up. But, There's a number uh, of countries with negative population growth. You're in one now, yes, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, Have you ever seen a UFO? Um, not that I couldn't make a good guess at what it was. Uh -huh. So yeah. you've seen UFOs, but you had good guesses about what they were. Oh, yeah. Okay. What do you know about aliens? Not much. <laughs> uh, what, what is life? What is life? Uh, I would say life is a um, self-replicating chemical system that is capable of undergoing evolution. So Jerry Joyce's NASA definition. Well, you're, you're happy with that? I'm happy with it. Yeah. You're happy. Do you have any reservations about it? You winced a little bit when you said you're happy. Um, I'm also okay with um, computer life. I think if you can make something in silico that has a certain set of properties, you could call that living. Uh, are viruses alive? No. Why can't? Why not? I'm going to say this virus is not because it is a parasite on another system that is alive. And if you take away that system, 
the virus fails, right? Like a molecule of RNA? For example. So RNA is not alive? Unless it's capable of replicating itself by itself. Mm. So. It doesn't do that anymore. I think, I think life is more of a systems property than a molecular property, probably. Right? A systems property? Yeah. Is the Earth alive? That's a system. Is the Earth alive? Well, no, does the Earth replicate? Oh, it's trying to. Is it? I think so. We're going to make another Earth? We're trying to. On <laughs> Mars. <laughs> That's, I mean, it may be that the, the biosphere is alive in the same sense that a cell is alive. Well, astrobiologists are often trying to find out what do we have on Earth in the history of life that has evolved multiple times independently, and then whatever that is, that would be a good candidate for a feature of life elsewhere. Okay. Do you subscribe to that idea? Give, give me an example of what you mean. So, for example, Simon Conway Morris just right. thinks, that, oh, my eyes evolved multiple times independently, therefore we should expect eyes, the aliens, to have eyes. Or uh, flight, good. or anything else that has evolved independently. Now, that's a hard thing to talk about, but uh, that's what he says. You're talking about multicellular macro-aliens. Multicellularity. Like Andy Knoll will say to sometime that uh, multicell complex multicellularity evolved multiple times, and if that's the case, then you might expect that's something that uh, evolved elsewhere. Did it? I mean, okay, so what would be the, in, like, kelp and... Well, you have to ask something? him about okay. that because I disagree with the whole idea oh. of multiple uh, independent origins because life has a single origin, so how can it be independent? Oh, <laughs> are you talking about multiple independent origins of multicellularity? Or? Well, that's what he would be talking yeah. about, and I would disagree with it because I believe everything's like deep homology is my answer to that co supposed convergence. That becomes a gray area, I suppose, right? Yeah, I <laughs> think so. So gray <laughs> yeah, that yeah. Uh, maybe we shouldn't talk about it. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. <clears throat> what, what part of your research is most relevant to assessing the probability of life elsewhere? So what I try to study is uh, chemical systems that are capable of autocatalysis. And those are chemical reactions that once they start happening, the products go back and speed up the actual reaction. Right? Do they have passports that say, I am terrestrial? Or can these, uh, are these things that can practice this everywhere in the universe? Um, I would say most of the things we work on would be things that would be ubiquitous. Candidates for universality. Yes. So you're not working just on the origin of life on this planet, you're working on the origin of life in general. My, my sense is there's going to turn out to be a single process. A single process everywhere in the universe? Yes. Why? Where, where do you get this sense? Uh, because I think that chemical space is very big. And chemical space, when we say that, is it's the total type or set of types of molecules that can exist. The actual space ends up being much smaller the things that get instantiated by natural processes. How does that selection happen? Uh, it's whatever the processes are that make chemicals. Uh, are they different on different planets, or might they all be the same? They're or? probably all the same. I mean, they're, all the same. So it, what, well, depending on the temperature and UV and so on. I mean, you might get it. It's kind of like if you bake a brownie mix at 300 degrees instead of 400 degrees. You still get brownies, but they're a little different, right? So, but the starting aggregates of atoms are probably about the same. And then the pathways that build up for those get more branched and more complex, but some of them are heavily trodden. A few are outliers, right? But my sense is that the, the ones that actually give rise to replicative phenomenon are not so many. A replicative phenomenon. Uh, yeah. Is that what you need to start Darwinian evolution? That would, that's the surmise, yeah. So I don't think, I think it's, let's, let's put it this way. Not any two chemicals can be mixed together to react, right? That's, that's the nature of chemistry, right? Some things are reactive with other things, some things aren't. Yes. I don't think any random set of chemicals um, is capable of giving rise to complex autocatalytic phenomena, right? But do you think there's like an infinite number which are? Well, I mean, in the sense that there's an infinite number of possible chemicals. Right? You can always add one more atom. So in that sense, it's an infinite set. Mm. Right? But okay. I mean, there's a finite number of atoms in the universe, so what does infinite well, mean? Well, not if the universe is infinite. <laughs> <laughs> so wait a minute. So let's, again, uh, the part of your research that's relevant to assessing the probability of life elsewhere is the idea that you are looking at autocatalytic cycles mm. that are potentially could be anywhere in the universe. That's right. Or 
most likely on a wet, rocky planet somewhere, yep. which are, seem to be everywhere. And so what aspect of the, the what kind of chemicals do you use? I say simple things, nitriles, aldehydes, uh, thiols. You sit there and put them in a vial, vial and then let them go round and round that's and round. Right, that's right. And we <clears throat> figure out, we try to figure out more and more fancy hands-off ways to see if they're doing interesting things, right? But is the kind of chemical disequilibrium that they're putting into the system one that we should expect to exist in the early Earth? I would say yes. I think um, there's a big, a very big cloud of unknowns about what the early Earth was actually like. And it, are we getting closer to resolving it? I'm not sure. I'd say in some ways yes, in some ways no. Okay, if we replay the tape of life, yes. if we could do that, do you think human-like intelligence would re-evolve? I would say yes. Because? Um, I think we do have a few independent examples of encephalization, right? Hmm. Okay. Simon Conway Morris would agree with you. I would uh, disagree with you. All right. So, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, it's a, I think there's a nice book just came out about whether or not, you know, cephalopods and so on have their own form of intelligence. I, I guess that's undebatable, right? Not in my camp, but other people <laughs> might debate it. I, yeah, well, it seems to me, I, I mean, it seems to me in the same sense, if you're going to make the argument that eyes are an inevitable outcome of the fact that there's light in the environment and there's some advantage to having a sensor, uh, it's my understanding that the first neuron was probably a photoreceptor. But do plants have eyes? Do they have photoreception? Do they have nervous systems? That's right. This is, a, this is the question, right? Why don't they have nervous systems in the sense that we have nervous systems? Um, I don't know. You, well, you were the one who said that it would be it would re-evolve. I, I, I would I would think it's adaptive. It's a question of whether the the well everything that exists is adaptive. Even English language is adaptive. Sure, but it's not going to re-evolve, right? Sure. Um, well, I guess it's a question of how rare are the, the the raw materials of nervous systems and intelligence, right? But it seems like it's baked in. I mean, it's it's a very complex um, reflex arc, right? But you said it's complex is one thing, adaptive is another, yeah. but a universally adaptive is still something else. Right? Would We're, you think it's not universally adaptive? I would say no, but a lot of peop most people would say you would agree with you. Yeah. Why uh, what would be your argument for why it's not adaptive? Well, I would, uh, I guess, A, vanity is the, is the main reason why people think it is, and B, when you look at, uh, because the Earth is not a single example of evolution, it has multiple continents that have, as far as landlocked vertebrates are concerned, are independent evolution. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at them, you do not see the independent evolution of human-like intelligence evolving elsewhere, independent of humans. I would use some data to try to assess this rather than uh, thinking it's just great because we have it. My adaptation is better than your adaptation. Well, okay. That's an that would be my argument. That's an interesting, that's a nice argument. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It, yeah, how would you really test that idea? Test that idea. Well, that's one way to test. I mean, I guess the argument would be we do seem to be decimating everything else on Earth, right? Oh, so that's a good thing. <laughs> well, that's, it's that's adaptive. adaptive. <laughs> you think that's adaptive? <laughs> I, that sounds maladaptive to me. Well, <clears throat> now, that, what? Now, I've heard that uh, RNA preceded DNA. What's the evidence for that? Uh, the, there's an argument for uh, evidence. Uh, it's the centrality of RNA in protein synthesis. The centrality right. of RNA, so in ribosomes. Ribosomes, messenger RNA, uh, tRNA, okay. you know, all the little parts of the translation apparatus. Um, also, the way that deoxyribonucleotides are biosynthesized is from ribonucleotides. And I mean, there are four independent pathways that are all done in that order, so. Uh, it starts with the ribosome, it starts with RNA. It starts with RNA. Okay. And then those are, those are deoxygenated, so. If I gave you $100 billion uh, with the caveat of you have to spend this money to try to answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? Well, it would have to be telescopes, right? Telescopes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure if we're going to find evidence of not, of, of not being alone, it will be beyond Earth. That would, that would be my best guess. So you don't think, I, but you just read the book, uh, 
yeah. 75 solutions, and one well, of them okay. was we wouldn't recognize them, and they are amongst us, so we just don't recognize them. Right, and I just don't know how you would start looking here if we're not How about nano-aliens and using electron microscopes to look for nano-aliens? That's a thought. That's an interesting thought. Um, I mean, so does, does finding life on Mars that is indigenous Martian life count as not being sure, alone? Sure, sure, sure. That is probably your safest bet. <laughs> okay. So you invest in Mars research. I, but I think actually telescopes are probably cheaper than Mars probes, mm -hmm. if, I, if I had to guess. So space telescopes. I think space so telescopes. So infrared uh, interferometer. What, whatever it takes. Space telescopes, even Earth-based ones, okay. probably, they're probably even cheaper. Okay. Some tells me very large arrays. and. All right. Now, you've been answering questions with your reasonable part of your brain, which is a very small part. But your rational, irrational part is much, much bigger, I think. So uh, let me ask you a question to your irrational part, your emotion. Yeah, close your eyes, get in touch with your inner self and say, what kind of aliens would you like to meet? What would you like to find? <laughs> well, yeah, wouldn't you like to meet the ones that are much more advanced than much you? Much more advanced. So yeah. you think advancement is a one-dimensional scale? Well, I just think ones that have answered questions that you still have. Like well, might be able if to they know those answers, then you're worthless because you, don't you take pride in how much you know? Worthless to them or? Worthless to them and worthless in general because it's all written already in the encyclopedia. Well, I guess <coughs> that's a question of why do science at all, right? If, yes, if, if all the science <laughs> problems have already been solved by this advanced technology. I mean, that's what happens to a civilization when they get contacted by another civilization that has better weapons, better this, better medicine, ah. et cetera. Well, I think it's sort of tragic. I think a lot of people feel this way, that your life is finite, right? There are questions that will not get answered in your lifetime because... Unless we meet aliens who are going to answer all yeah, of them. Yeah, that would be your best hope, that's, right? Well, that's, so you want to find aliens, kind of like God-like aliens who know everything, omniscient aliens. I think they'd probably be more interesting than the ones who are about like us, right? You want to talk to God, and you don't want to talk to any devils out there. Oh, well, there's devils, right. Well, on the other hand, it would be, be neat to find aliens that have completely different biochemistry, right? Then we'd at least be able to really talk about universals of... Now that's interesting life, for a yeah. biochemist, but I feel like I'm talking to the rational part of your brain again, not your, your emotional one. Uh, oh, then, yeah, well, for sure, the fancy ones. <laughs> the fancy the, ones? The ones what with the that? blinking lights, yeah, those, <laughs> and the ray guns. Yeah. The blinking lights and ray guns, no sexy aliens for you? I, well, <laughs> well you know, I just didn't want to be on tape yeah, with that, right? <laughs> well, it's just that, like, I've seen the movie Avatar, and they have this really sexy nine-foot-tall blue-skinned yeah, alien, yeah, yeah. and so I said, well, it must be some of the... So, some of the attraction to this question of are we alone comes from, I guess, young men getting off on these sexy aliens. But also, when I talk to scientists, it's always getting off on, hey, omniscience and intelligence, they're going to yeah. solve all my questions. Yeah. And uh, I guess there might be some other motivation, but I'm hard put, <laughs> hard put to find it. Well, right. Um well, uh, let me ask you. It just sounds like something you've thought about. What kind of aliens would you like? Oh, wait, Dennis. I'm interviewing you. Hey, I'm the interviewer. You're the interv uh, no, I'm the interviewer. Uh, so is this question, are we alone, an important question? I think it is. Why? I think it's a fundamental human question. Why does that make it important? Um, because it is, it's such a theme in our art and religion and science, and it's just a pervasive where am I, where do I come from, question of human orientation, right? Well, a lot of people want to just use religion to answer those questions, not yeah. science. But, it, but it's the same question, right? Whether you're using religion or science, it's, it's being motivated by the same intrinsic human desire. So, To know where things came from. To know where, yeah, what is our, our place in this? I know a lot of people yeah. who agree with you. Yeah. On the other hand, I also know a lot of people who couldn't care less. I know a lot of people who couldn't care less. So I, I, don't think it's, I don't think everybody feels that motivated by these things, but I think a lot of people do. Enough of them do that it's, you see it spring up everywhere, right? Uh huh. Oh. Now you talk to students about this, I bet. Yeah. And uh, what do you think are the students' biggest misconceptions about this question? Are we alone? Oh. Well, I taught a class that was sort of on this topic once, and I was actually really surprised to find when we got to the end. One of the first questions somebody asked was. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I just asked you, right? <laughs> yeah, no, and I was, I was sort of surprised, but I mean, yeah, it's one of these things. If you don't care, you don't care, right? Well, wasn't part of your job as a teacher to help them to care? Well, I, you know, 
I can inspire them I, to care? I can inspire you, but if you still don't want to care, you don't have to care. That's, uh, you know, that's maybe a, a nice way to go through life, really, in a lot of ways. <laughs> no, when I asked you about misconceptions, and then you said this woman didn't care. Well, no. But now, a, is that a misconception? A, this is a lead-in, a seg, <laughs> seg from this. Um, I think, well, okay, there's a lot of ways you can answer this question. I meet a lot of people say, well, haven't we already found aliens? I'm a good 30% of the people I talk to about this say, why, why are you still working on that? Mm -hmm. It's been solved. Right. And, I, and I'm always saying, what? <laughs> what did and I mean? And then they say, <laughs> Alan didn't Hills, we find it on Mars? I went on Mars. That's and the then one. you say? Yeah, that turned out to not be so compelling, right? Um, I also feel like there are people who believe we've picked up radio signals, right? And then you have the fringe group of people who believe they've been visited or so on. Um, is that a misconception? I don't know. Um, I think there are misconceptions about how, that we have a better handle on how likely it is that we're going to be able to answer this question. I think. Say that again? I think people really, so the first thing we started talking about is, you know, there's the multiple of stars, what's the probability of life starting, right? And it, you know, any algebraic equation where you're missing one of the factors, it's impossible to gauge what the answer is, right? Um, a lot of people, I think, are under the, the false impression that we have a better handle on this question than, than we do, mm -hmm. right? They think we know more than we do. I think so. I, I think there's people who think we've already found the aliens. Right? Well, I mean, there's that, but I think that people also maybe have a little more confidence that scientists are, you know, we're always five years away from being able to answer this uh -huh. question. So you know you don't know anything then. They don't. I think if you're honest with yourself that you would have to say there's a lot of things we don't know, right? I don't know that we don't know anything, but I think, for example, that, that one question, how easy is it for life to start? It might be just about impossible, right? Might, might be a, a coin flip, might be anywhere in between, right? I've heard about the Gaia hypothesis. What do you know about it and what do you think about it? Uh, this is the notion that the entire biosphere is sort of a self-regulating -regula organism. James Lovelock, Lynn Margulis. You don't give it to Bernadsky, huh? A little bit, okay. sure. Um, he invented the term biosphere, right? I think he did, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, and, the, and the, the, the concept of Gaia, I think, is embedded in that. Okay. But, um, anyway, what do you think of that idea? Yeah, I think it seems quite reasonable. <laughs> that, you, that there are long-term biologically mediated feedbacks that sort of self-stabilize self things. Makes now, some sense. Richard Dawkins has argued against this idea because he said it's hard, it's impossible to mm. get global level regulatory mechanisms because there are no competitors. Ah, do there need to be? Well, I, for evolution, to, we have variation and then you have selection. Uh -huh. Those are two ingredients. Well, if you don't have variation, at the biospheric level, you don't have variation. You just have this thing that's doing something, and you don't have a whole bunch of these things that are doing something, and therefore you're not selecting uh, from them. What's a, the key aspect of this? I was thinking of it more like a thermostat. Yes, it's but a thermostat, if it's an adaptation, if it has evolved, it has to have evolved potentially at the global level rather than subglobal. And mm. at the global level, there aren't variation, and therefore you can't evolve it at the global level. That's the argument. Right. I think this could be a very complex nonlinear system with a lot of weird feedbacks that we haven't figured out yet. But still you need competition to, in I, order to have selection do any work. But couldn't the competition and selection be removed a couple of degrees? Subglobal, for example? For example. Yes, I agree yeah. with that. I agree with that. Okay, and uh, do you have any advice for students about thinking about this question? Good ways and bad ways to think about the question, are we alone? I don't think there are any bad ways to think about oh. it. <laughs> I can think of a million bad can, can ways. Can you think, to think of a bad way? <laughs> sure. All right, all right, give me two. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Well, I guess a religious way is one way I consider bad because it, it's not a sci I'm a scientist, so I think uh, this question should be addressed scientifically rather than saying, oh, God did it. Yeah. And so that would be, in my book, one bad way of thinking about it. Another bad way of thinking about it would be, it, as you point out, oh, I don't care, it's not important. Mm. And uh, so that's what I think bad because I think it is important because it has the potential to revolutionize who we think we are. We're trying to figure out who we are, mm -hmm. and so I think it's an important question to try to answer that. Uh, so those are two ways. Mm. Can you think of a couple more? 
There are no bad ways well, you said to think about that. I, I would say probably, any bad way is a way where you think you have an answer already because mm -hmm. I don't think there is one yet. You know? oh, okay. I, I, overconfidence. I, overconfidence be overconfident. at this point. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I find something interesting lately, this, this notion that we're living in a simulation mm -hmm. is funny because it really does in some ways circle back to our religious belief, right? You're the product. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, I think it circles back to one dimensionality of technology where you have advanced aliens producing simulations in the way that we're producing simulations. Well, that's almost a creator, though, right? Yes, yes, that's right. That's <laughs> yeah, right. yes. Yeah. I mean, well, I, and I guess there is nothing in Christian theology that says that the creator couldn't be a. An advanced civilization. Uh, yeah, a hacker from another dimension. So, so often, <laughs> I mean, often I accuse scientists of look, being very religious in the sense they're looking for God, but they say they're looking for aliens. Mm. Uh, you know, but uh, they're really looking for God because they want to find some, something that has all the answers and is an advanced civilization, so that's kind of what God represents. Mm. You agree with that? Yes, I think if you're loose enough with your definition of God, you can fit it into that. Yeah. <laughs> I know, and I think, I think that's the kind of definition of God you ought to have. But. <laughs> okay, Are, now there seems to be a dichotomy in the field between metabolism first and like RNA information first. Uh, do you subscribe to either camp? I don't. I mean, for the longest time, I really thought there was a logic to this genetics first thing. But I think there's a lot of ways of storing information besides nucleic acids and linear tapes and all of this. So um, they're, they're probably two faces of the same phenomenon. Okay. And uh, are we alone? As I said, I, I would be very surprised if we are. And why? because I think the probability that life has started somewhere else in the universe is very high. Have they visited us? I, I'm agnostic about that. Why do you think the probability that life has started elsewhere is very high? Because, going back to this, I think that we are starting to see with radio exploration, radio astronomy, and what we know of our solar system, planetary probes, that the chemistry of our solar system is not unique to our solar system. Right, that the, the disk forming chemistry is pretty consistent, right? And disk forming chemistry is what we need to form life. It's the ingredients that go into forming a planetary system are have a lot of commonalities across, from what we can tell so far at the disks we've been able to observe, right? Mm 